Dear Father in heaven, I am asking you earnestly to have mercy upon me as I undertake this very heavy responsibility. Lord, I am an earthen vessel according to your word, which means there is always the risk of some dirt contaminating the message since it comes out of a vessel made of dirt. To avoid that, God, I am asking you to grant me your spirit that the truth may be protected from my fallen condition and that the minds of your children gathered before you may similarly be protected. So please, for the sake of the truth, grant me the words from above. As David said in 2 Samuel 23 verse 2, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me and his word was in my tongue. Father, put your words, please, in my tongue. I offer this prayer from my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Go with me to Genesis chapter 12. We shall begin reading at verse 1. We're reading from the King James Version. Genesis chapter 12, reading from verse 1. Now, there are people coming in. There are chairs being brought in. You have seen people before. You have seen chairs before. So try to focus right here at the desk. Not because of me, but because that's where the word is coming from. I know we're easily distracted, but make an effort to discipline your mind and listen. What book did I say? What chapter? Beginning at what verse? Reading from what version? Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Are you with me? Now look at the details of what God said. And I will make of thee a great nation. Verse 2 of Genesis 12. And I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, or as one version says, in order that thou might be a blessing. When God called Abraham, one of the reasons God called him, if not the primary reason, was not simply for his personal salvation. God called that man in order that through him, All the families of the earth might be what? Blessed. Now in the course of this message, we have to identify what this blessing was and what it means for you and for me today, thousands of years later, what it means to us that God told Abraham, I am calling you to be a blessing to the world. I will bless them that bless thee. Verse 3 of Genesis 12. And curse him that curseth thee. And in thee, finish it for me, shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now I want us to identify a few details in that passage. God tells Abraham how he will react to those who react to Abraham. What two reactions does God mention? Blessing. Those are the only two God has. Are you with me? Anyone sleeping? People in the balcony listening? All right. I'll take that one hand as representative of the entire population of the balcony. (laughs) And I will bless them that bless thee and Curse him that there are only two ways to relate to Abraham. As a representative, of course, of those whom God has called to carry out a specific mission. Now, let us look at this concept of either blessing or cursing all the way back in Genesis. Let's go to chapter 1, reading from verse 20. Genesis 1, verse 20. And our subject for this morning... Murderers on the loose. Murderers on the loose. Genesis 1 verse 20 the Bible says, And the Lord said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, 
and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great wills, and every moving creature that liveth which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. Here we have God blessing. And of course, when he makes Adam and Eve, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. God blesses. Now in Genesis 2, verses 16, 17, go there with me. As we continue, murderers and aloofs, 12 minutes to 12. The Bible says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but... Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof. Finish that verse. Thou shalt surely die. That's a curse. But let's see the word curse used more directly. Genesis chapter 3. Very next chapter. Verse 17. This is God addressing Adam. We're continuing murderers under loose. We're looking at blessing and cursing. The two reactions God has. Because we have two reactions to him. We bless him or we curse him. We bless him by accepting his message. We curse him by rejecting the message. Verse 17, Genesis 3. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, you read the rest. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. And God himself cursed it. In Genesis 5, when we read about the, the genealogy of those who descended from Adam, talking about Lamech, the son of Methuselah. In verse 28 of Genesis 5, the Bible says, And Lamech lived 180 and two years and begat a son and called his name Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us concerning the work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. Blessing or curse? Let's track this dual reality through scripture. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19. Murderers on the loose. The fifth book of the Bible. What is a scholarly word for the first five books of the Bible? Pentateuch, yes. 25 cent word that means the first five books of the Bible. What chapter did I say? Ah, couldn't hear me. Thank you. Chapter 30. What verse did you hear? Okay, you heard 14. I should have said 19. Either you misheard or I misspoke. Let me take the blame. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, the Bible says, this is God speaking through Moses, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. Now, this is serious. Now, when we hear the expression heaven and earth, that means everywhere. Wherever there's a place. God says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, to serve as witnesses that I have set before you. What? Life and death, go on, blessing and curses. In other words, life and blessing, same thing. Curse and death, same thing. Therefore, choose life. In other words, choose what? Give me another word for life in that verse. Choose choose blessings. Now, God can't compel the will, but God loves to offer suggestions as to how to choose. Now, God says, I can't force you to choose, but I know the, the outcome of those who choose my way. Please choose blessings. It's like God sitting over your shoulders and exam, and he says, pick A. Multiple choice, pick F. Pick C. Choose life or choose blessing that both thou, what do the other words say? And thy seed, meaning there is a ripple effect to choosing blessings. What's the flip side of that coin? There is a ripple effect to choosing curses. And we see that in the second commandment. Showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the and generation. Listen to me. When you act 
When I act or behave or choose or respond, it is not an individual experience. It has a ripple effect. We need to understand that. So that in some way and to some degree, what happens to some people with respect to heaven on earth depends on how we behave and the choices we make. That's why the Apostle Paul says in Acts chapter 20, reading from verse 25, And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone, preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you this day to record that I am pure from the blood of all men. Why? For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Paul says, look, what he's saying in reverse, if I had not preached the message without hesitation, without diluting and watering it down, your loss of eternal life would have been my responsibility. Now you tell me, if I were to ask you how many of you have a loving heart, all of you would raise both hands. We love to view ourselves as nice people. And you look nice. Do you realize as nice as you look, your hands can have blood on them? Murderers on the loose. Do you understand some people will be in hell and some of us would have contributed to their loss? Now, I don't know the law. I see my friend, Brother Dave, somewhere I saw him. Perhaps there's a law that says if you see someone dying, you, you ought to do something to stop it. There are people in, what's this town called? Mentone. <laughs> I thought it was San Bernardino. <laughs> That's where the crusade will be. There are people dying every day. Are there funeral homes in Mentone? There's one? Well, there's one nearby. That serves Mentone and Colton and San Bernardino. Every day they do business. Six minutes to twelve. Every day they do business. People die. Let me ask you this. If your neighbor to your right dies tonight, will that person die having had an understanding of the third angel's message? Because you are the neighbor. Yes or no, but don't say it out loud. How many of you are enrolled in school? Raise your right hand. All right. Those of you who didn't raise them, you're in school, but perhaps you're not doing well, so you didn't want to raise your hands. I understand. God bless his hard work. Try a little hard work. Turn the TV off. See how much of a genius you possess. Doing well in school does not require genius. It requires organized hard work. That's a digression. I had to do it because I've counseled so many years. You're in school. The person who sits next to you, you share notes. You study together. Not a Christian. Does the person know that there is salvation through faith in the blood of Christ? Or are you busy comparing who is up to date with the fashions of the world? Your colleague on the job. Who takes a break every five minutes to smoke? Does that person understand that this body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? And that God will destroy those who defile this temple? Does he or she understand that through your ministry of loving witness? Your spouse, who is not a Christian, and you knew it before you got married, At least you can make up for that by making sure that person has an intimate knowledge of the fact that Jesus died to provide salvation from, as they say, the guttermost to the uttermost. God called Abraham to be a blessing. Now, you're either a blessing or a curse. Now, the blessing is life, the curse is death. Now, I realize I am making some extreme statements, but sometimes a preacher has to make an extreme statement, then back up a little, but the point has already been made. The simple fact is the watchman on the wall does not sound the alarm, people die.
Now, what does what God said to Abraham have to do with you and me? Well, the Bible says in Galatians 3.29, If ye be Christ, finish it for me, then are ye Abraham's seed. Now, the seed of Abraham participates in the blessings of Abraham. The seed of Abraham is connected to the covenant God made with Abraham and all the blessings and benefits attendant upon that covenant. So that what God required of Abraham, he requires of his seed, which is that we should be a blessing. What is this blessing? In Genesis 12, 3, God says, And in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, all the families of the earth, give me one word for that. World, everybody. Does that include the Muslims? Does that include the Hindus? The Buddhists? The Zoroastrians? Yes. The animists in southern Sudan? All of them. Now, when God spoke these words to Abraham, were there other peoples living on the earth? Yes. But God said, this blessing must come through you. Not you and the Amalekites and the Perizzites and the Kenizzites and the, and the Amalekites. Mm -mm, through you. Now that is being specific and particular. When Jesus on the Sermon of the Mount looked into the eyes of his disciples, he said, ye are the light of the world, and them, and them, and them. Is that what he said? Mm -mm. You. You. Now if you're the light of the world, which Abraham was called to be, light is life. In him was light, and life was the life of men. If he was the light of the world, but did not let his light shine, You understand the tragedy that ensues. A murderer on the loose. What is this blessing? In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Let's go to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. And I'm grateful for your air conditioning. Those of you who know me a little bit, you know that uh, one of my spiritual gifts is perspiring in the pulpit. So I'm very grateful, really am, for uh, your cooling system, which is helping me tremendously up here. What book did I say? Who wrote Acts? Paul? <laughs> Pastor, <laughs> you have some work to do. Come to Bible school. <laughs> Who wrote Acts? Luke. What other book did you write? <laughs> yeah, that's right. What was his profession? Quickly, quickly, you're too slow. He was a doctor. Can a doctor witness for Christ? Yes. Come on. Any doctors here? Raise your hands quickly. If you're proud of your profession, come on. Huh? A doctor is a powerful witness. I'm digressing again. Luke was a doctor. And he wrote Bible books. The two volumes he wrote amount to about one quarter of the New Testament. Powerful man. And modern historians who study the book of Acts and Luke, they have concluded Luke was perhaps the preeminent historian of ancient times. His history was so reliable. Thank you very much. What's your name? Who? That's a good name. Is that the church say amen? amen? All right, from a G. Luke chapter 3. Reading from verse 19. This is the second sermon Paul preaches. The first one we usually call the sermon on what? The sermon on the mount? No. The sermon on the day of Pentecost. In chapter 2, Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. Here Luke, uh, Paul, having or Peter, having healed that lame man by the beautiful gate... And in verse 6 of Acts chapter 3, you know, Peter says, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And the man jumped up and leaped. And as he begins to explain what happened, because the people were looking at him. And he wants them to understand this man was healed through faith in the name of Christ, the prince of life whom they slew and hung on a tree. Whom God raised from the dead. Verse 19 Peter says, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive to the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. All the way back, the gospel has been preached. 
Look at verse 22. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which shall not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after as many as have spoken have likewise prophesied or foretold of these days. Now verse 25. We're trying to identify the blessing in Genesis 12.3 when God said to Abraham, In thee shall all families be blessed. Verse 25. Ye are the children of the prophets. In other words, what the prophet spoke of, which essentially was the gospel, the covenant God made with Abraham, Peter is saying, you are of that tradition. You belong to it. You are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all kindreds of the earth be blessed. Peter repeats the words of Christ found in Genesis 12, 3. Now he identifies the blessing. Verse 26 of Acts 3, unto you first. Why does he say unto you first? To whom did Jesus come? He came unto his? Yes. He sent the disciples, he said, go not in the way of the Gentiles, but go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I'll start with you and work through you, as I started with Abraham with my intention of working through him and his descendants, the Jews, with whom I could never have any success. Verse 26, chapter 3, the book of Acts. Unto you first, God having raised up Jesus, his son, his son Jesus, sent him to do what? Ah, here's the blessing. What is this blessing spoken to Abraham way back? Sent him to bless you first. What is the blessing? In turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Now, this is the blessing. What is the blessing? Salvation. From sin. What is the blessing? Righteousness by faith. What is the blessing? Justification. What is the blessing? The new birth. What is the blessing? The process by which God renews and regenerates a man and presents him to the world as different, changed by God's doing and declaration. Now let's take a look at the same thing as Paul speaks of it. Galatians chapter 3, our scripture reading. What was our scripture reading for this morning? Verses 1 through 8. But we'll only read from verse 6 of Galatians 3. Of course, Paul is upbraiding the Galatians for moving away from righteousness by faith to righteousness by works. He's amazed that they can so quickly be misled by false teachers. Verse 6, even as Abraham believed God and it was what? Counted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore, verse 7 of Galatians 3, that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Now, what was it God's, uh, Paul said of Peter, Paul said of Abraham in verse 6? Even as Abraham did what? Believed God. And what happened? It was for, this is righteousness by faith. That's what Paul is talking. Now in verse 7 he says, Know ye therefore, that they which are of faith, is that the same faith of Abraham? Yes. The same are the children, meaning they receive the same thing that Abraham received when he exercised his faith. They are the children of Abraham because of faith in Christ, according to verse 29 of the same chapter. Now verse 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would do what? God would do what? Are you reading with me? And foreseeing that God would justify whom? The heathen, that heathen refers to all the families shall be blessed back in Genesis 12, 3. And so the Bible says, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all what? Nations of the earth. Same text that Peter uses to say, this means turning away every one of you from his iniquities. This was the blessing that God was to bring on the whole world through Abraham. The blessing of what God made available to us through Jesus Christ. The blessing being God's remedy for sin. The blessing being the way God takes a sinner 
and makes that person fit for the society of angels. The blessing being the knowledge that there is power to break every addiction. There is power to be released from every temptation. There is power to choose right. The blessing being the good news that that prostitute in San Bernardino can be delivered from that profession tonight. The blessing being that the knowledge that that pimp, that drug addict, that smoker, that alcoholic, that thief, whoever the person is, can be delivered. I've spoken to many parents who have to pray for my children. Why? They left the church. One is smoking, one is on drugs, one is this, one is that. All of us are God's children in some form or fashion. Creation or salvation, both. God so loved the world, all he gave his only begotten son. God's heart breaks when he sees people heading down the path of destruction. Now, this concept of Abraham's seed, it's uh, 10 after 12 already. But don't pay any attention to that. In John 8, I want to get back to God's heart breaking. But let's go to John 8. Jesus has a running discussion with the scribes and Pharisees. Let's pick it up from verse 37. He tells them, you shall know the truth. The truth shall set you free. And in verse 36, if the Sunday four shall make you free, ye shall be free. Indeed, in verse 37 he says, I know ye Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. John 8, 37. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. I speak what I have heard, you do what you, you have seen with your father. They said unto him, Abraham is our father. Notice verse 37 again, or 38. I what, says Jesus, I speak that which I have with, ye do that which ye have with, how many fathers do we have? Two. The fathers in that verse represent behaviors, responses to the gospel. When God is your father, you respond to Jesus one way. If the devil is your father, you have another response. Are you listening to me? I know I said earlier God is the father of all in a certain sense. When a man consciously rejects God, God is no longer his father. Because Jesus said, he is your father to the devil. So Jesus says, what I do comes from my father. What you do comes from your father. Then they said, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if ye were Abraham's children, ye would do what? Ah, do the works now. The, God is saying, look, Jesus says, Abraham's children behave how? Like Abraham. And we call that principle, like father, like son. Are you following me? I'm getting back to God's heart's breaking because of those who are lost. Jesus says, if you were Abraham's children, he would do the works of Abraham, but now ye seek to kill me. A man who have told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. Abraham did not do what you're doing. So there is something faulty about your reasoning that you are the children of Abraham. Based on your behavior, you're not. I don't care what you say. Based on your behavior, you are not the children of Abraham. Because you're trying to kill me. There's not a principle in scripture. Inasmuch as you've done it unto one of the least of these my brethren. Finish it. You've done it unto me. Now by not telling the gospel to people. We're trying to kill them. If you do it to one of the least of these my brethren. You've done it unto me. We're killing Christ. With all our vegetarian patty. Soy milk, and tofu. We're killing Christ. Because we're killing his people for whom he shed his blood. And we claim to be the children of Abraham, but we're acting like children of the devil. We have no interest in seeing people saved. Let me tell you something. 
I don't find a Bible verse that says it, but the concept is in Scripture. The concept of crowns, 1 Peter 5, 4. When the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. The concept of stars, Daniel 12. They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever. We have the concept of stars and crowns with respect to those who get to heaven. So when Eloi says there shall be no starless crowns in heaven, it's biblical. How many stars in your crown? I'm putting the cart before the horse. Do you have a crown? All right, Paul knew he had one. He wasn't boasting. He was just standing on the certainty of God's word. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. To be in the kingdom, you've got to have a crown. Are there crowns or stars in our crowns? Do you understand you cannot enter the pearly gates with a starless crown? Because the essence of the gospel is unselfishness. The star represents the effort you have made outside of yourself to save someone else. The star represents the sacrifices we have made in the interest of someone else. A starless crown means I made no effort to save anyone. And by not trying to save people, we destroy them. And many of us are murderers on the loose. When Katrina hit New Orleans, what government agency came in for tremendous criticism? FEMA. Why? FEMA moved how quickly? Too slow. There is something about an emergency that tells us move fast. Move with a sense of urgency that matches the emergency. Move as though it's a matter of life and death. Let me tell you, Katrina is nothing compared to the hell that's coming. And we're sitting around, occupying spaces in the pew, engaging in politics in the church, folding our arms. Well, they didn't send me a bulletin, so I'm not doing it. Hmm? If you heard General Motors was giving away cars free downtown Mentone, and they send out bulletins but missed your house. And you heard about it and you were still in time. Would you sit in your house pouting and say, well, no flyer came to my house. I am not going for my Escalade. Mm. You would jump up and go get yours, flyer or not. So no flyer for freedom from fear came to your house. So what? You're a child of Abraham? Say yes or no, quickly. Was that the truth? What are you doing to save people? Now, the heart of God breaks. Because God gave everything he had when he gave Christ. Do you understand what I just said? We don't usually understand that concept because when we give, we give but we hold back something. How many people pull out, when an offering plate comes by, how many people do that? Now, the pastor would love that. But how many people pull out the wallet and do that? Because if the person did that, the deacon might say, no, 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 you didn't see what you were doing. You're blind. Get better glasses. Here, here's your wallet back. Mm, we don't do that. We go in. We pull out something like this. We put it in. We make sure we have bus fare and grocery money. And then we put the wallet back in our pockets. We hold some back. God understands that. God could have called for all ten. He called for one-tenth and an offering. We do the same thing with respect to... The work of evangelism. We hold back. So if there's a crusade, we say, okay, let me get involved. I'll go nail a poster onto a telephone pole, which is very impersonal. I don't have to talk to anybody. I just nail this thing on there. I have done my work. And in a 10-minute service or whatever you call it now, we check off uh, contacts made, one with a telephone pole. God gave everything. As wise as God is, and he's wise, God, in making the plan of salvation, carrying it out, he was left without a backup plan. Now, all of us have backup plans. You apply to medical school, did you just apply to one? No. You apply to many. Because if you don't get into Loma Linda, the number one medical school in the universe, then you perhaps get into some other medical school. So the University of Michigan. 
or Harvard, one of those lower schools. But you had several schools as choices. You had backup plans. God had no backup plan when he sent Jesus Christ. You think about that. Businesses have risk management departments. Manage the risk. What if, what if? Heaven has no risk management when it comes to the giving of Christ. God gave him and that was that. If Christ had failed, the consequences would have been more than cosmic. What are you and I giving? It's 19 after 12, I have to stop. We have been called by God to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. The Freedom from Fear Crusade, not because I'm the speaker, because when the idea first came up, remember Dr. Dan, I said, please pray and ask the Lord, Lord, do we really want this man speaking? And I was not joking. I don't like to stand in a pulpit where I was not sent. Because I'm certain to stand alone. And the pulpit is no place to stand alone. No place. This outreach effort begins September the 8th. Here's how a converted people should behave. I don't want to be harsh with you, but listen. When a converted person hears there's an effort to save souls, that person calls. I hear. There's an effort. What can I do? That's one amen. I'm waiting for the other amens. I don't have much time. <laughs> A converted person, just like God, his or her heart breaks for souls that are dying every day. Not only in Menton and San Bernardino, but in our families. So a person in whose heart the fire of the gospel burns, that person wants to know, what can I do? Give me something to do. A person doesn't sit home. Say, well, I don't like who's speaking, so I'm not. I don't like the chairman of the board of planning, so I'm not doing anything. I don't like Pastor Kirkpatrick, so I'm not doing anything. I don't like Jesus, so I'm not doing anything. Are you a murderer on the loose? Because if you're not saving, you're killing. Too responsive. Blessing, curse, life, death. You know, in Romans 6, 16, Paul says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are? Whether for life, obedience unto, unto life, or, or disobedience, uh, sin unto death. One or the other. Sin unto death, obedience unto righteousness. One or the other. Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters. Either he will love the one and hate the other, hold to the one and despise the other. It's always this or that. And I want us to confront this issue as we close the service, and I am closing it. Am I a murderer on the loose? I don't have to shoot you to kill you. I can just withhold water from you. I can withhold that antibiotic from you. I can tell you, look, there's water around the corner, knowing that there's quicksand, but I never touched you. Are we murderers on the loose? My brothers and my sisters, what will you do, not just for freedom from fear, but what do you do to lead people to Christ? To save them. For in saving them, what do you think I'm about to say? We save and I must put it in quotation marks because we know God saves us, but you understand what I mean. We save ourselves. So as God watches you right now, as the Holy Spirit touches your heart and mine, as the angels wait to record your response, I don't know if the unfallen worlds can see us if they can as they watch. 
And the angels watch. As God's manservant asks you the question. This first question is tough. Take a deep breath before you respond. If you know in your heart you have not made efforts to lead people to Christ, you haven't. Never occurred to you you ought to do it. And by so doing, you may just be a murderer on the loose, but you want it stopped now. Let me repeat. If you know in your heart you have been doing nothing to lead people to Christ, which means you've been hurting them. And you want that to stop now. Stand up now. Don't look around. You just get up. You have not been active in trying to lead people to Christ. And you want to stop that. Because by not leading a person to Christ, you're hurting that person. Stand up. It takes courage to get up. It takes courage. We must be the children of Abraham. Let me come closer to home. We must be the children of the Seventh-day Adventist pioneers. They gave their lives for the work and for the message which they believed. They gave their lives for it. Some died of simple work. Died working for this message. And we stand on the gravestones and waste God's time and his resources and our opportunities It's a disgrace to the memory of the pioneers. Let's not go all the way back to Abraham. That's dusty history. Just a hundred years ago. God bless you for standing. I say it from my heart. God bless you for standing. I want to pray for you first and then make another call. But before I pray, let me ask you, who's standing? You've stood to say, Lord, I have not been active in trying to lead people to Christ. If you will say, now, Father, forgive me and show me simple but effective ways whereby I can witness to people. If you'll ask God to do that for you, raise your right hand. Now, are you serious? Hands down. Let's pray. Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus as a merciful God. You delight in mercy. Look down upon your sons and daughters who have stood to confess that they have not been active in trying to save lives from the Katrina of hell that is coming. Father, we've repented and we ask you now to show us simple ways in which we can lead souls to Christ. And thereby be life savers, not murderers, on the loose. Dear God of heaven and earth, God of Calvary, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, please, Father, put a burden on our hearts that we may feel the need to save the lives of people. Because we are the light of this world. Those of you who are sitting Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Anyone who will say, Lord, I will do all I can for this crusade coming up, freedom from fear, whether by financial contribution, by my time, being a volunteer Bible worker, or by praying, I will try to do something that the results may be to your glory. If you will say that, would you stand with us? I will try to do something to support this outreach effort. Because that's why the church exists. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature under heaven. I will try. If you're a teenager, ask God to lead you some teenage friend you have. Teenagers listen to teenagers. They won't listen to me. Your doctor, invite doctors. Your dentist, invite dentists. Your lawyer, invite lawyers. Your carpenter, invite carpenters. Your woman, invite women. There's something every one of us can do. Let's do it. Let's be lifesavers on the loose. Not murderers on the loose. Every head bowed as we finish the prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you to receive us, dear God. We're not lovely nor lovable. But Father, you love us. And Calvary proves it. I am asking you, dear God... Hear me. Hear me, please. 
Help us. Change our thinking. Help us to understand we are indeed the light of the world, the salt of the earth. And as Abraham stood as a preserver of Sodom and Gomorrah, as he pleaded with the Father, Father, you preserve those cities as Abraham pleaded until he could plead no more. Lord, help us to understand we must intercede for these cities. We must intercede for sinners. So give us a burden for souls. As your heart breaks with every person who dies lost, let our hearts break that we may act. Hear this humble prayer I plead with all my heart. And I thank you for hearing and answering. In Jesus' name.